Audio Jungle. documented 
about the missionary we call Hudson Taylor. That one time as he prepared, I think that is the name, as he prepared to go into China to take a mission there and reach out to the Chinese people, one specific group in particular, he longed so much that God will use him in that domain. And as time passed by, he continued preparing and was very moved from his European background, wanting to make sure that Christ would be communicated to the Chinese people. He went there out of uh, a lot of passion and a lot of struggle. He began a, a, a rather demanding job, fought and struggled with the system of the day. Finally, there were people who turned around and followed Jesus Christ. In excitement as he took them through the Bible teachings over time, a gentleman approached him one day after they finished a class. And the gentleman was so bright on his face, radiant. And he said, Brother Taylor, for how long have you known this beautiful truth about Jesus? The missionary said, it's been quiet for a while. He said, okay, for how long has your homeland known this beautiful truth about Jesus? And he said, for more than two centuries. He said, two centuries? Two centuries? And you appeared here the other day? He said, you know what? His face now turned around and he looked sad. For more than 20 years, my father went roaming through the woods, going from shrine to shrine, wood to wood, forest to forest, seeking the truth. He was convinced that there is some truth about God somewhere and he needed it. For 20 good years, and he died before he had this truth you are telling me. Why did you not come sooner? Charles Taylor, his high eyes just dropped. They said, I'm sorry. It took me that long to come. The gentleman repeated, Why did you not come sooner? Today as we speak, there are people who are not in a very good emotional, mental, and spiritual state. And soon enough, when we begin sharing the word of God, you will be surprised at how they respond. And some of them will be like, I'm glad you've arrived, but someone else is gone. Because they never got to hear the truth. We are called to be effective witnesses because we have an assignment from the king. What I want to speak about today, effective witnesses, I give it a, a, a subtitle in three points. The facts, the pattern, and the example. We are speaking about effective witnesses, not about effective evangelists. It is because Every time we talk about evangelism week, we begin seeing evangelists. The word is evangelism. <laughs> and here the Bible teaches something very different from that perspective. We are not all evangelists, but many, uh, rather all of us, are called to be what? Witnesses. Praise the Lord. An evangelism office is a special office given by the Lord Jesus Christ to specific people with an assignment to equip and prepare the witnesses for effective witnessing. Did you get that? So that it is an office. They are called into an office not only to witness but to equip the church to witness. Which means, in the church of Jesus Christ, every person is a witness. Amen. And the greatest uh, challenge that we face in that is when we have a wrong understanding of who an evangelist is, we consequently have a wrong application of evangelism and witnessing. 
The presence and function of evangelists among us just should encourage us in our witness to the world and not make us lazy. Because sometimes there is this notion, those are the people God has anointed for the work, okay? And as such we become lazy. Or the other reality happens, we feel inferior. Hey, I cannot just compare with that brother or sister. If you want someone who knows how to do crusades, we know them. You get that? A sense of inferiority. And I think that the greatest reason why the gospel spreads slower than is expected is because we mostly see it as an assignment for the evangelist instead of the witness. As such, this is a call from the Lord to everyone who believes in Him as the Lord and Savior to participate in the Great Commission as a witness. But then, who is a witness? I would like us to explore together. We had prepared an easy worship presentation, uh, but it couldn't work, so we just have exactly what I have here. You have a good moment to preach together with me. Amen. So let's look at the three things I want to highlight. Number one, we want to talk about the facts. Say the facts. And if we get to understand who is a witness, we will be ready to answer whether we are witnesses or not. Amen. First John. Now, in the interest of time, I have the scriptures also in the sermon, so you may not necessarily turn to your Bible, but you can follow together with me. Can we read it together? Three go. Let me join them. 
So he joins the people who are being baptized. And right there, standing there, uh, he sees people being baptized and finally the pastor is done and he's standing there looking at the pastor. The pa pastor looks at him and says, would you like to be baptized? He says, yes. Yes. But yes, I would like. And so the pastor brings him in. The baptism uh, required that when you are baptized, uh, you, you are asked some questions, you go under, then you are brought up. So the pastor gets in and says, I now want to baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. He puts him in the water, pulls him out. Says, have you seen the Lord Jesus? The drunkard said, no. The pastor decided, I have to take you the second time. <clears throat> have you seen the Lord Jesus Christ? He said, no. The pastor uh, got agitated and says, for the Lord's sake. In, and then he brings him out. Says, for Jesus' sake, have you seen the Lord Jesus Christ? He said, are you sure this is where he drowned? <laughs> Witnesses have an experience with the Lord Jesus. They don't hear about him, they know him. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Because this is the reality, my brothers and sisters. You cannot introduce someone you don't know. Do you agree with me? Yes. I have introduced these friends because I know them. It is hard to introduce someone that you do not know. Praise the Lord. Amen. I want you to listen to this. On May 24th, the year was 1738, a discouraged missionary went very unwillingly to a religious meeting in London. There, a miracle took place. About a quarter before nine, he wrote in his journal, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. That missionary was John Wesley. The message he had that evening was the preface to, the, to Martin Luther's commentary on Romans. The words in the first chapter, the 17th verse, Romans 1.17, became his turning point. Just a few months before, John Wesley had written in his journal, I went to America to convert the Indians, but oh, who shall convert me? Oh, who shall convert me? He had gone as a missionary to convert who? The Red Indians. This is what happened. Right in that place, a Moravian pastor asked John Wesley as they were interacting one evening, you came here to convert the Red Indians. Are you yourself converted? Those words disturbed John Wesley. And that is when he went and wrote this. Who shall convert me? Who? What is he that will deliver me from the evil heart of mischief? I have a fair summer religion. He was religious. I can talk well, nay, and believe myself while no danger is near. But let death look me in the face and my spirit is troubled. Nor can I say to die is gain. This man went to do missions when he himself was a mission field without the Lord. Effective witnesses, first of all, have an encounter with the Lord. Now this is the good news. If you are not sure that you are born again, actually you can get born again today. Because that is where it begins, amen. I took a mission to a place in Baringo South and we did a mission. I went with a girl among the group we went and we were sharing. So I witnessed next person. You will witness it to the next person of house. Then you know that way. So when it was this girl's round, she said, please, brother, do it again. I said, wow. Okay, I'm going to do it. Maybe you are a bit afraid. I did it. When I made the invitation for people to get saved, she was a missionary. She was among those who received Christ. 
It is possible to fail to witness because you are not a witness. Praise the Lord. Second characteristic of effective witnesses is that an effective witness volunteers the life-giving gospel to the world. They volunteer it. Okay? You volunteer. They say, we have looked at and we have turned. Now we proclaim. Did you get that? We proclaim. That means we speak it. We speak it. We tell them. We proclaim. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The word of life in context is of course the person of Christ. Amen. And he says, what are we proclaiming? The life appeared. We have seen it. We testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life. We are telling you this is life. This is the very life that is found in our Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel only wants, not only wants of embedding judgment as we proclaim it, it also provides protection from that judgment. As we tell people, come on people, you need to listen. The Lord Jesus loves you. Judgment is coming. We remember, the same gospel says, whoever finds Christ will be saved from that judgment. And that is the gospel we bear. Praise the Lord. Effective witnesses have come to experience the Lord and are ready to do that. The gospel is a lifesaver. Amen. It wants of impending danger. Every time you see a lifesaver on the road, you just step on your brakes before you see what is wrong. Amen. Yes. It is a life jacket. You put it on so that when you uh, fall into the sea, you have to float. As you hope that before the shark takes one of your legs, the rescuers will have arrived. That is exactly what the gospel is. Everyone, my brothers and sisters, has eternal life. Everyone, turn to your neighbor and say, you have eternal life. <laughs> but where to spend it is your choice. <laughs> we grew up knowing you die in hell or you live forever with Christ. Wrong doctrine. You either will live forever in the presence of the Lord or live forever in torment. That is the Bible. The problem is, when that time comes, there will be no room for choices. It is now. Amen. Number three, an effective witness. Can we read it together? Okay, we can do better. Genuine love and care for. We do it not simply because of point two we have said that we just declare. Provided they hear. <laughs> I have read in crusades, God forgives our sins. In 2005 I was preaching and at one point I'll be up the air this way. And I hit the ground and dust comes up and I'm telling people, if you don't listen, provided you've heard. <laughs> Until when the Lord invited me to begin working on a book to train people on evangelism. And I got him say to me, provided they hear or until they come. I was troubled for a whole day. I'm going through the Bible, I discovered the heart of Jesus is very different. It is not provided they do what? It is until they come. Okay, they may not come at the point when we say it, but there is some more we need to push into them. Amen. The primary motivation for the proclamation is not to leave the world guilty, because that is the work of the Holy Spirit, but to win people over into fellowship. He says, we proclaim to you. There are words that are underlined, okay? We proclaim to you so that you also may have fellowship with. The goal is fellowship, belonging. It is dangerous to go out with the mentality, provided they hear. Yes, the truth is they will hear, but it should go beyond that. Care enough, full of love, to draw them to God. Only that kind of love 
will save the heathen. Only that kind of attitude will save the heathen. Fourth and final point on that. An effective witness knows the joy that accompanies sharing faith with, with others. The day I led the first person to Christ, I was on top of the world. I don't think anyone else was like me. Who? Me? I led somebody to Christ. And in fact, that person did it in tears. Woo! Jesus, you are sweet. I was on top of the world. I felt good. But let me tell you, the joy of winning this person to Christ is nothing compared to the joy that fills heaven when the person comes to Christ. Amen. I may celebrate as an individual, but as far as scripture is concerned, there is a party in heaven concerning one person. Do we want to deny heaven parties? You know, there is someone who is singing something like that. I'm not sure about my ember in heaven. But one thing I know, some people may you behind me and say, Thank you! Thank you! I'm in heaven because you did something about it. There is joy in heaven. The third is that the joy of knowing that God can use you to win us all. Amen. Can you imagine you and me? How do you refer? Now, we have looked at the facts. So by now, from the four points, you actually know whether you are an effective witness or, or not. And so God has set us in a place he needs to challenge us beyond that. Let's look at the pattern. The pattern. There is a scripture there. Please follow together with me. What are the qualities of an effective witness? We have looked at the formation. The facts was about the formation. Amen. The formation of an, an effective witness. Now we look at the pattern. Okay? It says, For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply in word, but also in power and with the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know how we lived. You know, uh, rather, you know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the word with much affliction, with joy, with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Now, the call to be a witness is not a call to an event. It is a call to a daily practice. Praise the Lord. We have a great event happening this week. Some major. But that event is supposed just to bring out the normal practice we have as Christians. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now from this scripture, I have four. Normally there are five, but for the sake of today, I have put them into four. Four things that we have to look at that are important remind us of what needs to be the pattern of an effective witness. Number one, we have, they are all beginning with letter E. You can see that, eh? First is enriched in the word. It says, because our gospel came to you not only in word, which means the word was the primary, okay? Not only does not mean the word was not there. English. It means the word was the first. Are we together? Our gospel came to you not only in word. Of words. NIV would use words, uh, but the real key is word. The words are spoken at the word of God, okay? It came in the word. You need to strengthen yourself, my brothers, and determine to say, like I would, I have the word of God as the primary tool and gift to pass on. We are not going to tell people stories, right? All those stories are, are good. In fact, I'll give a story shortly. We are going to convey the word of God. It is the tool, say tool, and then the gift. For you, it is the only thing you can take hold of and give to people that brings life. 
When they receive it, they have received the gift. And this word has the power to change them. For all scripture is God breathed. And it is useful for instruction, correction, rebuking, and training in righteousness that a man of God may be thoroughly equipped unto every good. Study to show thyself approved unto him. A workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You hear those scriptures? Colossians 3.16 Let the word of Christ richly dwell in you in all wisdom as you teach and admonish one another with some songs. Are you hearing? Let it richly dwell in, in you. That is the lifestyle. It is the pattern. You need to be pregnant with the word even if you are a man. We never get pregnant physically. But we need to be pregnant with the word of God. So that we deliver it to people. Amen. Are you following? Are you listening, my brothers and sisters? The word of God. You have to have the word of God. It is that which can penetrate. The Bible says it is living and active. Hebrews 4.12 It penetrates to the dividing of soul, spirit, joints, marrow. Can you imagine? Something that can separate between the soul and the spirit. I'm a theologian. Up to date we still argue what is the difference between the soul and the spirit. We don't know. And yet the word of God has no problem with that. It divides. That is how powerful it is. Number two, endued with power of the Holy Spirit. We are not only enriched in the word, we are endued with, with power. The Bible says our gospel came to you also in power and in the Holy Spirit. Spirit. I have coined the two. Normally I would discuss them separately, but for now, let's look at them together. Remember Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Jesus spoke to them, it is not for you to know the times that have been said by my Father, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit is come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Witnesses are witnesses because there is power. You cannot be effective without power. That is why we invite people to moments of prayer. We invite them, please spend time, let's talk to God about the hearts of men. And God releases power and he frees them from the bondage of sin. I have the presence of the Holy Spirit, I have God's presence and I need to cultivate the presence of God in my witness. The third pattern is enthralled with a burning conviction. You have a burning conviction. It drives you crazy. You cannot settle. You feel like I just want to tell them. I have to tell them. If you are not convinced about something, even your eyes show it. In marketing circles, I hear, they train you that if you are marketing something, you know you can sell ice in the land that has ice bags everywhere. You talk nice about it and you can see how people respond. The iris begins growing big. They're like, ah. They tell you the next thing is put it in the hands of the children. One person learned that secret. He was passionate about selling mandazi in Kitale. So he decided he'll not talk to the parents because they were not buying. He came with his mandazi, he accounts to Peter. Watoto waliye, watoto waliye, watoto waliye. And the kids began grabbing the stacks of the mothers. Ah! Mothers! Mothers! The mothers could not accuse the man. He never told the children. So either the mother brought out money, or I'm kebe, it's called Shelly B. Chota maindi kidogo pe huyo mtu ape mtoto manda. And the whole village was in noise. Mother! The man was convinced he had to sell his mandas. Are we convinced we need to take Jesus to the lost? You have to set the hearts on fire. Praise the Lord. Amen. Conviction. You see, conviction is evident. The way I talk about what I do. I can come and say, by the way, you don't like even your man. At Jesus, I need to know your not too sure about what I'm doing. Just try, really, just try. Would you say that is conviction? No. For I know whom I have believed in, and I am persuaded. 
I know I'm persuaded. Those are the two characteristics of conviction. Amen. You need to have a burning conviction. I would rather someone with conviction and zeal and lacks of knowledge because I can train on knowledge. Amen. Amen. Rather than have a person who has all the knowledge about witnessing and has no conviction. For sure. Number four is they are enabled by a godly lifestyle. Enabled by a godly lifestyle. The word enabled. A godly lifestyle is enabling. It empowers you. You can't go away. You are the servant. A godly lifestyle is enabling. Amen. I want you to listen. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your He's not saying what we said. He's saying you observed us. He says you became imitators of us and of the Lord. You followed our pattern. There is something you saw in our pattern. You liked it. You embraced it. Paul was very confident. He was so confident about his life that he would actually tell people, follow my example as I follow Christ. I have a few times told people that and they were willing to follow until when they found that I'm a human being who made silly mistakes at some point. And they ask, uh, uh, on this one, on this one, am I still supposed to follow? I say, no, 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 don't follow that. Here, Jesus is still working on me. <laughs> they look at my impatience, my temper sometimes. Praise the Lord. But can we dare that as we continue, no one is perfect, right? We, are, we have not been perfected. And yet as we walk with the Lord, He is shaping us. And people can look at us and follow us. And the truth is, people are always observing. Someone has said, you are either a good example or a terrible warning. <laughs> enabling environment of godliness. You have to choose to live. Let's go back. You have to choose to live such a good life among the pagans, as the Bible says, so that though they accuse you of wrongdoing, they may glorify God on the day he visits. That's First Peter chapter 2, verses 11, 12. Live such good lives among the powers that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may glorify God on the day he visits you. The same thing Jesus spoke in Matthew chapter 5. I think it is verse 15, 16. You have to have a lifestyle that is enabling. If you love the Lord, you will not indulge in things. You want to teach people about purity and you yourself, you keep a brother or a, a sister in your room, not for intercession across the night. <laughs> if it was my, the youth in our church, I was a big one around. <laughs> I received a clip that showed me about the, this reality not long ago. About a, ma a lady who really uh, insulted uh, a border border guy. And the border border guy felt very discouraged. But then some people went to witness to him and he was ready to get saved. And they said, Your case is so good, you have responded so well. We just need the superintendent from our church to come and pray for you to get born again. And who appears? The same person who was cursing him. Say no. No, no. I don't want your church. 
And because they were saying, please listen, he just stood up and began running. He was hit by a car and died. What's that thing in your life that you really must address so that you enable yourself to be effective in witnessing? My friends, let's look at the last one in the interest of time. Let's look at the example. How would Jesus effectively witness on campus? I want you to see Jesus walking around on campus. How would he? Now, there are some sweet realities there that I don't need to discuss a lot. Today is not a training day. Why campus? Why are you not going to witness at Mudurwa Market and campus? Because there is an opportunity here. Amen. Nations meet on campus. That is number one. There are many people who come from every possible village and nation on this campus. If the institution I, I learn at has about 50 nationalities, how about this one? It's even bigger. Secondly, there are many readily available platforms. Right? You share classes, courses, rooms, you enjoy even sports, whether you are playing it or cheering money or whatever team. You can make a lot of noise, celebrate about that and forget to talk about Jesus. No. A preacher came and said when he was in campus, he used to be, when he was admitted first year, he went into his room very happily and then he finds the roommate. He says, my name is so and so. I am born again and I don't joke. <laughs> the gentleman listened and said, oh, thank you. Uh, and my name is Mahamud so and so. I'm a Muslim and I don't joke. <laughs> they closed the door before they started. Number three. The need for Christ on campus is conspicuous. You don't need people walking around saying, Hey, stop! I need Jesus. You just need to see a person with drugs. And that is a call. You need to see someone who is involved in negative media, pornography and all the likes. And that is a call. You need to see the moral, uh, lose moral values around. And that is a call. You need to look at the non-religious, irreligious. They actually are not aware that there is a CU service running right now. They don't know. In fact, some of them are, right now as I talk, they are beginning to find navigation where it's north and south. And there are those who worship even in the wrong forms. Have you considered that uh, the movement of Prophet Dr. War is a lost movement and we need to help them? Maybe we need to think about that. Now, Jesus and the uh, woman of Samaria, someone has said the woman of Samaria was the biggest woman in the Bible. She covered some area, Samaria. Now, let's look at, at some, some lessons. Let's look at some lessons about this woman in the next few minutes. They are there. So, Allow me just to go very quickly. Amen. You know the story is in John chapter 4. We cannot read the chapter. Jesus comes by the well at Sychar, the well of Jacob, looks at these people, uh, uh, this woman, and they begin a conversation. She thinks, I have just found a new client, only to discover she's speaking to the Messiah. And the story goes in a way that finally she goes and calls the whole village of Sychar. Come see a man who told me everything I ever I ever did. She got born again. The whole village came and they said, we believe, not because of even what you said, but because of what we have seen and heard ourselves. That was a ripple of evangelism. I have done a seven page write up on that chapter, uh, which uh, can be very helpful in understanding this subject more. But some lessons on how Jesus dealt with that woman. I only capture a few in the interest of time. Number one, put aside negative attitudes. Do you think Jesus knew that she was uh, uh, in her, she had a, a sixth man in her life? Do you think she knew? Did Jesus knew? Yes. He knew. Amen. How did he catch the attention of this sinner 
while his disciples silently wondered why he even dared talk to her. Attitude. Okay? Knowing someone's sins does not qualify to give you an attitude towards them. Love is a different attitude that we need to embrace. We already spoke about that. Amen. Secondly, consistently make friendly connections. My senior pastor shares a story. They used to have a table. He was in Loa back in 1990, 89-1991. And that table was called the Jerusalem table. It was the most hot brothers in the Lord. Hot on the Holy Spirit. Fiery. And then there was a Judea table by some who felt close to them but not exactly. And then Wengine and Mataifa. So they planned a week like we have planned. And so he goes with a, another person, they knock on a door. And the lady opens the door, looks at them and says, huh, it is the week of saving us, eh? You have finally come. After one year, he, she closed the door. Because there were no continuous connections, okay? Now, this is not to say because you've not connected, don't go. Go. Let them embarrass you for a moment. That's okay. If they will have to. But many of them will listen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Jesus struck a conversation with a Samaritan woman, and that is what changed her life. Don't isolate yourself. That is the problem of Christians. We isolate ourselves. Insulate yourself. Do you know what insulation is? This microphone is using some power. But I'm holding and I'm not being hit by some shock because the plastic casing is an insulated. It cannot transmit current. And that is the reality. We are people who have full current but insulated so that we do not buy into the standard of the world but still can associate with the world. So that we take Christ to them. Praise the Lord. Yes, be human. Don't try to behave an angel in this week. Be human. Talk to them as a human being. Jesus did not even tell this woman, I am the Messiah. She kept her saying, You are a teacher? The next one she said, You must be a prophet. Finally, she said, When the Messiah appears, he shall. Tell us everything. Then finally Jesus says, I who speak to you, I am he. Did you get that? It had been a normal conversation she kept suspecting. Mualimu, I teach of the word. Hey, hey, no. He knows that I've had five men. No, this is a prophet. It goes on. Finally, I come on. This is the Messiah. Jesus was human. He just behaved normal. And that changed everything. Begin from common ground in sharing faith. Don't use eschatological terms. Paracletic. Homoios. You make them wonder, are we, are we speaking about the photosynthesis I learned? <laughs> Begin from common ground. Jesus said, give me a cup of water. And as they begin talking, he says, if you knew who is speaking to you, You'll actually ask him to give you the water that wells up into eternal life. Physical water, he speaks about spiritual water. Amen. Yes. That is the connection. Begin from the common ground. Begin, this is water. And here the Bible also talks about the water of life. I witnessed to a man uh, some time ago, and he was smoking. And I said, by the way, because they did a medical course, I think this one is hurting your life. Your lungs will be disturbed, your heart will become calloused and you're not like it. He said, yeah, I'm aware that those things are not good. I told you, by the way, those are physical elements God created, but they also speak about the heart and how you respond to God. I began with the physical and went into the spiritual. You begin where people are. If you're in a bus driving, as one person has said, you say, oh, so we are headed in the same direction. He looks at you and says, it, it depends where you are going. You say, I'm going to heaven. What about you? <laughs> Begin from the common ground. Praise the Lord. Now, finally, show them their sin and the solution that is found in Christ. Jesus showed the woman her immoral life and finally co confirmed her gifts. He was the Christ. You know, as you share, you say, 
Don't you think this thing is hurting your life? Don't you think you need a solution? But the problem is human solutions are weak. There is a permanent solution. Christ! Point out how simple it is and how we cannot save ourselves from it except in the person of Christ. And that is when you invite them to make decisions for the Lord. For their sake. Shall we bow our heads? Father, we thank you. We praise you. We glorify your name. Because you have been pleased to speak to us. You have called us to be effective witnesses. We pray today that people will never cry out and say, why did you not come sooner? Because of our complacence. We thank you for the reminder. And this week I pray that our hearts will be stirred with a holy passion. A holy passion to lovingly and caringly to witness to people and in deep conviction win them over to the family. It is about their destiny, it is about their future, it is about their very lives. So be glorified. Maybe you are in our midst here and you really are not born again. I want to offer you an opportunity. I'm not the one who will save you. It is the Lord Jesus. But I want to allow you to respond to God. Because I'm sure that you've been hearing his voice as I have even spoken. You would like to give your life to Jesus Christ. The Lord does not promise to be smooth or through. But it promises that there is someone to carry you even in the rough terrain of this life. You would like to surrender your life to Christ. What a privilege. What a moment. Would you lift up your hand and just see it and take note that there are people who want to yield themselves to the Lordship of Christ. You say, yes, Jesus, I want you to save my life. Would you lift up your hand and I will see it. Thank you. Thank you for those hands. Please lift it up. I want to see. I have to see clearly. I see two hands. Any other person? You're saying I need the Lord Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Please can I have some two ushers to just stand up? Two ushers. Please put, put, put my brothers, put your hands up. Uh, I just want to identify you so that I'll pray with you. Two ushers, kindly stand up. Yes, uh, right over here, there is a brother, go over there, and then behind there, I need another usher, there is a brother behind there, who, uh, someone who needs to get born again, take note of them, right after this I want to have a moment with them. So Father, we thank you and we glorify your name. Make us effective, and you us with power, let your word bubble in us, let the glory of God be revealed as you work in us and through us to save the world. In Christ Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you. And have a great week of witnessing.